Greetings, everyone, and welcome to our next SNARL seminar. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. And uh, before I introduce our speaker today, I just wanted to uh, make a few announcements and let you know that we are having our outdoor science education programs at SNARL and Valentine this summer with a limited number of classes, um, relatively small classes, but some really great classes. So if you have kids, you have neighbors, you have grandkids, um, please check out our website, which is VESER, VESR.NRS.UCSB.EDU. And you can go to the education and outreach tab and you'll see a link for the outdoor science education program. I also wanted to announce that we also have posted a schedule for our Valentine public tours for the summer. So we have a bunch of great tours focused on topics ranging from wildflowers to bears to history to geology. Um, and those are a great way for you to get in and see Valentine and learn a bit about the natural history of this area. Um, and you can browse those as well on the same tab, look for Valentine public tours. You can register online and you can also contact us um, if you have any further questions. So um, those are our programs for the summer. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker for tonight. Um, many of you know Dave already. Dave is a, a staple, shall we say, of Snarl. Dave has been a part of Snarl um, for, a, for a really long time. And we're just so fortunate that we've had Dave here for all those years. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background on Dave. He first started scientific research in the Eastern Sierra in 1976 at Mono Lake. And many of you probably know Dave for his work at Mono Lake. Uh, these studies then began his graduate research projects at Oregon State University, after which he returned to the Sierra to continue as a research biologist with UC Santa Barbara. Uh, studies of salt lake ecosystems and the ecology and physiology of aquatic invertebrates and algae have been major themes of his research. So besides working at Mono Lake, he's also studied spring ecosystems in the Great Basin. And along with these desert environments, his main research has been in the streams of the Sierra Nevada. Stream research has included studies of sediment deposition and effects on benthic invertebrates, establishing a monitoring network to detect the effects of climate change on mountain stream hydrobiology and investigations of the impacts of a variety of disturbance stressors on stream community ecology, including livestock grazing and management, forest use practices, acid mine drainage, introduced invasive species, roads and erosion, and the restoration of degraded habitats. The focus of many of these studies has been to provide a scientific foundation to inform management decisions by state and federal environmental and regulatory agencies. And as many of you know, Dave has been a part of SNARL for many, many years and recently moved to the coast in UC Santa Cruz. So he's now um, traversing the Sierra Nevada between the coastal streams in Santa Cruz and then the high alpine streams here in uh, the Sierra Nevada. So. It's always a pleasure to have Dave come back in the summertime to do his work here. And recently he started up a collaboration with Connie Millar, um, looking at rock glaciers too, which is an exciting new frontier. And so um, I'm really excited to hear his talk tonight, kind of combining this new work with his classic work in stream ecology. So welcome Dave. Um, Dave will be talking um, his seminar tonight about rock glaciers and the ecology of alpine streams, refuges from climate change. And so Dave, we do expect you to answer that question. All right, thank you, Carol. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, I hope you're all enjoying an icy beverage to go with the rock glacier presentation. I myself am drinking a lovely vermouth from Northern Italy. It'll keep me uh, Cheers. Keep you from getting too parched. <laughs> all right, I will share my screen with you all. All right, is that up and looking right? Yep, that looks great. Okay, very good. So, full disclosure about this talk is that. 
Um, I have no research grant to do this work. This is really just a retirement project for me. And I, at this stage of my career, I would rather have fun with no funding than funding with no fun. And uh, it's weird to tell little jokes and there's no audience there visible to me, but I hope that's a little bit entertaining. <laughs> um, so uh, this work is based on in large part anyway, a new publication that's out recently, Rock Glaciers and Cold Rocky Landforms, Climate Refugia that appeared in Global Change Biology. And I'd like to give credit where credit is due to uh, major leaders in this, Stefano Brigenti, who is a Northern Italian. He's a, I met, first met him when he was a, a graduate student. He's now a postdoc and he's done some fantastic work uh, in, the, in the, the Southern Tyrol region of Northern Italy. And of course, to Connie Millar, who is the queen of rock glaciers. And I'm very happy to be um, doing some work with Connie these days. So uh, my long-term interest has been in streams in the High Sierra. Uh, streams uh, in these mountain regions are full of diverse aquatic invertebrate life. Uh, these invertebrates are key to food webs and to the function of stream ecosystems but they're under threat. So the first thing I'd like to tell you a little bit about is how I conceive of the, threat, the threats that are related to climate change and, uh, and mountain streams. So what you see here is, a, is a, um, a hydrograph, a typical hydrograph. You can see the months of the year there and stream discharge. The, the blue part of the hydrograph is the typical hydrograph that you'd see in a mountain stream where you get a peak of snow melt in the, in the spring and into early summer and then recession and then down to base flows through the summer and fall. Um, under um, changing climate regimes though, what we're expecting to see is patterns of earlier snow melt. And this is what we are already seeing developing in a lot of mountain regions. Um, in addition to that earlier snow melt that um, translates to earlier and prolonged uh, low summer flows. And it also means that there's gonna be periodic drying of perennial streams. And we're seeing this in a lot of circumstances uh, during the, the more recent um, extended drought that we experienced from 2012 to 2015 and already seems to be underway once again this year. Um, wetter and more erratic winter flows also occur mostly because um, there's a greater proportion of precipitation that's falling as rain rather than snow and so that's resulting in erratic um, winter runoff patterns. At its extremes it um, results in rain on snow floods. And these can really be catastrophic events in uh, Sierra streams, um, changing the geomorphology of channels and of course affecting the aquatic invertebrates. Um, this all then is going to be um, uh, changing in addition to the flow pattern uh, into uh, certain conditions where we expect there to be warming waters, although there's some cases where it looks like there's actually cooling going on, but that might be related to groundwater. But in a lot of the lower systems of the, the river systems, we're expecting to see warming and have seen warming already. And because there's less um, uh, snowpack, because we're experiencing snow drought in many years, there's decreased groundwater recharge. It's that um, slow melt of the snowpack into the ground that um, really is what recharges a lot of the groundwater in uh, mountain streams. And so some of the consequences of this to streams are how habitat changes. Now, the next set of slides I'm gonna be showing you um, result from a really fun collaboration I had with a student artist here at UC Santa Cruz over the last year. This was um, one of my COVID projects. And, uh, and uh, the, 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 the idea was to try and depict some of the changes in both stream habitat and stream invertebrate uh, communities um, over a period of changing flows. So high flows and flood conditions are one of the things we see, um, as you saw on that last slide, um, where um, headwater uh, streams are facing these extremes of high flow conditions and floods that can be um, scouring, but all the way to the extreme of, uh, of channels um, experiencing extended drought. And so this next series of pictures relates to how that, that changes. So at these high flow conditions, pretty much the whole channel is very turbulent, high flows, and there are, um, there's a lot of riffle habitat. So the two primary habitat types you're gonna find in streams are these erosional riffle environments that are typically shallow water environments and then depositional pool environments. So under 
more moderate flow conditions, you see an, a, an easier view of that distinction between the shallow rocky riffles that um, are uh, intervening with the uh, deeper pool environments. And under these moderate flow conditions, we're just gonna simply be seeing fewer years of these average, average range flows. Um, you, can, you, can, you can talk about a normal flow in the mountains, but there is no such thing as normal. There's a statistical average and that's about it. And we're gonna see um, fewer of those kinds of conditions. What we will see more of though, is these low, low drought flow conditions. Um, and this can really be a critical bottleneck because now a lot of the riffles are disappearing. Um, at, the, at an extreme, the streams start to become fragmented and there's very little flow or none in the riffle habitats. And so riffle inhabiting organisms really are threatened by these conditions. Um, you get near stagnation because of the low flows and the drying to these fragmented pools is gonna result and has resulted in uh, pr profound community changes. So some of the research I've done with Scott Cooper um, over the uh, um, last 20 years or so that we published not too long ago um, came from the Kings River Experimental Watershed. And so some of this artwork here um, is a depiction of the results we've, we, uh, we found in that particular study. Um, we were able to observe conditions over a long period of time that ranged from high flow flood years to the prolonged drought from 2012 to 2015. And we are actually able to do sampling both in the second and fourth year of that prolonged drought. So in this left panel here, what you see are the dominant riffle in, um, insects. And so this is just a, a sampling of a few of the, the insects that you find in streams. So these big pearled stonefly predators intermixed with little betas mayflies. So that would be the main consumer in the form of the betas mayflies and the main predator in the form of the um, pearled stoneflies. In the center panel, the main mayfly grazer that inhabits riffles um, is a, a, a heptogeneid uh, mayfly, several species of that. And then over on the right, there is a mayfly, um, Paraleptophlebia, that is actually able to inhabit both riffle and pool environments, um, rather than just being uh, uh, pretty much exclusively uh, living in the riffle environments, as are the, the insects in the two panels on the left. And so this, uh, this nice painting on the right depicts what things would look like under, under average flow conditions. As we change into the first um, initial part of the drought, two years after um, the, uh, the period of drought um, had begun in 2013, when we did our first sampling, one of the things we saw was that there was a great concentration of water. So as the drought went on, of course, there's less flow in the channel. And so there's a contraction of the, of the uh, morphology of the channel, and so uh, a concentration of the organisms. And so we had higher densities of both the stoneflies, the betas mayflies, the heptogeneid mayflies, and the, uh, the paraleptophlebia mayflies. So it seems to uh, indicate that at least in the early parts of the drought, the insects have some resistance to this uh, initial effect of drying. But as you get into the low flow drought conditions later in the drought, um, where you actually start to see a lot of intermittency development and developing and fragmented flows occurring in the channels. Um, the low flow conditions are now drying to mostly pools. Um, the riffles are disappearing. And uh, what you see is a, a huge decrease in the pearled stoneflies, the betas mayflies, and the heptogeneid mayflies. Um, the mayfly that's able to inhabit pools as well as riffle um, uh, continues to thrive though. So paraleptophlebia you might think of as a winner in this climate change game uh, of which there are really, really relatively few um, and the losers are definitely much more prominent. Uh, of, the, of the common mayfly, stonefly and caddisfly species that we found in these streams, about 40% of them significantly declined by the end of the drought, um, that fourth year of the drought that is to say. So some really important consequences then to the drying of streams. And so that brings us to ask the question, what are the sources of the water that can support, continue to support these aquatic insects um, and the communities that thrive um, around them. They're processing algae and organic matter, converting that into tissue and, and then uh, passing that along to their uh, predators in the form of fish and amphibians and riparian birds and bats. So uh, an important consequence to the, to the whole food web. So um, 
Headwaters, typically they're coming from snow melt and rain. Those are the surface sources of water, but there's also groundwater seeps um, and springs and connection of that groundwater with channels that are forming the primary sources of stream flow. Um, so what about um, other frozen sources of water? Um, studies were done in the drought year of 2015 that showed that 90% of the base flow of the Tuolumne River came from melt of the Lyle McClure glaciers. Um, so that sustained flows for a time, but that's only gonna last for so long. That's only gonna last for as long as uh, the glaciers last. And we know that they are disappearing at a rapid rate. Um, so that brings us then to what other sources there might be. And an overlooked water source uh, is the melt of rock glaciers, which could either be a good name for a band or a hidden mysterious source from which water seemingly pops right out of the rock. Really interesting features. And I must say that um, when I've been out on tours with, uh, with Connie, really curiosity has gotten the better of me. And so I've really become interested in these systems and have started doing um, some sampling of those habitats. And here's a couple of photos that Connie passed along to me um, that show the characteristic kind of scalloped surface form of the glacier, the rock glacier. So you can see in the upper picture there, that sort of scalloping of ridges, and, and especially in this lower one from the Gibbs Rock Glacier viewed from the Dana Plateau, it's especially easy to see um, the, the scalloping of that that indicates the under, uh, the, the, the movement of ice under that, that uh, rock surface. So how widespread are these? Um, studies that have been done looking at glaciers versus rock glaciers in the Sierra Nevada and the Great Basin. Um, surveys done by Basajic and Fountain, uh, published in 2011, showed that there were 122 active moving glaciers in the Sierra um, uh, among 1,700, uh, 1700 some odd perennial ice formations total. Um, and then Connie amazingly went throughout the Great Basin to inventory rock glaciers and found 842 of these features, published just a couple of years ago. And 55% of those um, occur in the central and southern Sierra alone. So not even a, a full inventory of all the rock glaciers that can be out there. Um, uh, they estimated that 10 to 20 times as much water is stored in these rock glaciers than in the perennial ice, field, ice fields and glaciers, so a considerable amount of hidden water that's there. Um, mostly these rock glaciers have a northern aspect and they average about 10, uh, 10 hectares in size, and they are of two basic types, the ice core type and the ice cemented type. Um, so the ice core type is basically a, um, a pre-existing glacier that has rock debris and avalanche on top of it, fallen on top of it, and so buried it in a, in a, in a debris field of rocks that then protects it from solar radiation and maintains uh, the, uh, the ice in a more or less intact state. The other kind is an ice cemented glacier, and this forms when uh, melting water percolates down into a matrix of rocks and then refreezes, forms a permafrost, and, uh, and, and, and then there can be intermixes between these types, both um, this perma permafrost um, freezing of the meltwater uh, occurring along with glacial ice. So it's not one type or the other, there can be mixes of the two. Um, and so uh, again, two types of rock glaciers, the buried type, which is a debris clevered glacier, and those that form permafrost. So those rock glaciers that form permafrost, they can form within rock fields of moraines, of talus slopes, of valley walls, and um, the melt from those um, rock glaciers will form streams, wetlands, lakes, and spring brooks of particular types. And here's a wonderful illustration made by uh, Stefano's wife that uh, shows both um, some of the same photographs of uh, the particular types of a rock glacier and then um, uh, a, a kind of a stylized cartoon of um, what those look like and how they form and where they occur. So um, how does the water come out of these rock glaciers? So there's um, both active or moving or inactive, non-moving um, rock glaciers with ice in them still, and there's relict ice glaciers, those uh, rock glaciers, those from which the ice has basically melted 
but um, has the, the water has pooled up at the base of those. So um, the, the ice is shown in the upper two A and B um, diagrams, and this is from the, the, the published paper, um, is shown in yellow. And you can see from this that during the wet season, a lot of water can be generated both from uh, rainfall and snow melt that percolates down through the rock glacier, as well as the melt of the core ice that's in the rock glacier. And in the dry season, um, because uh, there's relatively little of that going on, there's relatively little um, spring fall, uh, sorry, spring flow that's uh, occurring um, at the snout of these glaciers. The relic glaciers, on the other hand, um, because most of the because the ice is all melted, there's the, the water is stored at the base of that rock glacier, and during the wet season, um, there's as much water coming out of it as as there is from an active melting rock glacier. But in the dry season, there's even more water coming out, at least for the time being. Uh, and so these relic glaciers can be um, a bigger source of water during dry season flows, and and might be an important. Um, uh, type of rock glacier that, uh, at least in the short term, can sustain stream flow. So uh, contrasting these then with um, other alpine water sources, the rock glaciers have um, more stable cold and stable outflows. They have low sediment content, and they, they tend to have higher dissolved mineral content in them as well, although this probably varies with um, the, 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 the type of lithology that's there, the, the rock types that are present. Glacial melt channels have this cl more classic unstable channels, very cold water, turbid flows with the classic glacial flower that you can see both in lakes and streams and very low mineral content. Um, groundwater string, uh, spring brooks, they tend to have more stable channels, they have warmer flows and they have various levels of dissolved mineral, usually fairly high. Uh, seasonal snowmelt is variable. It has warmer water temperatures and low dissolved mineral content as well. So um, you can see from this that the rock glaciers have a distinctive sort of signature of the, the type of flow that's there, the type of sediment content and dissolved mineral content relative to these other sources. So it raises the question, because of those differences, are there differences in the biology of the streams? So I'm gonna move on now to the collaboration that um, I have underway with Connie and show you at least one of the rock glaciers um, that we're doing most of our work on. So this is a view of the Excelsior Rock Glacier, Excelsior Peak and the bubble on the left looking south into Yosemite Valley. A little bit more of a close up of that rock glacier. You can see some of that same kind of sculpting of the surface, that scalloping of the surface of the glacier. And here is the, the layout of the study. So now we're looking north again, rock glacier in the bottom here. The toe of that glacier is at about 10,500 feet. And the outflow is where the blue line starts. So um, uh, below that, where the first um, yellow uh, point is, is where um, we started doing the sampling. So in 2019, um, we went there with a group of folks to, um, who were interested in rock glaciers and did some sampling there, as well as at the Barney Rock Glacier um, further south um, on the way up to Duck Pass out of Mammoth. And, the, and the, what was interesting about contrasting these two rock glacier types is that um, this uh, Excelsior is thought to be the ice core type, whereas the Barney Glacier is rock glacier is thought to be more the permafrost type. Um, so then the, I returned in uh, 2020 uh, in the fall of 2020 and uh, uh, early in uh, late October and uh, resampled this same first site, the same upper first site, but then also went downstream a few hundred meters and sampled the site um, that is still influenced primarily by the flow from the rock glacier. And then further downstream, this third site down is influenced likely by another rock glacier nearby that may be a relic rock glacier, and also by potential subsurface flows that are coming out of Summit Lake, Summit Lake right on the boundary with Yosemite. And, uh, and then further downstream, another site that um, is definitely influenced by flow from Summer Lake and uh, the creek that comes, uh, Summit Lake and the creek that comes out of it. And this is just above Upper Hoover Lake. So a contrast of four sites that are actually with, in fairly close proximity to one another. It's a little over a kilometer from the upper to the lower site here. 
So what are the habitat features? So this is looking upstream from that upper site. You can see that um, there are flat plates of granite and shallow water flowing over them. And as is true of a lot of flows that you see in these sorts of rocky environments in the Alpine of the Sierra, um, it, they're, they're probably quite porous and deep. Um, you often hear water trickling down below rocks and nothing on the surface. And uh, this is um, something that's evident upstream of this location, but this is where the water has daylighted for about 50 meters upstream from here and has formed this um, shallow habitat of flat granite plates. Um, most notable though, is that there's this really dense coating of an algae slime on the rocks um, that uh, occurs in these rock glacier streams. It's also found in cold streams throughout the world and it's known as Hydrurus fetidus. Um, it is very slippery, mucilaginous, um, but it harbors protected habitat and food to aquatic invertebrates. Um, but it's a very dense covering over most of the rocks in these kinds of um, uh, upper habitats of the rock glacier flows. This is a micrograph of what Hydrurus looks like you can see tiny little cells of chloroplasts in here, um, but it's mostly within a mucilaginous matrix, which makes it an easy place to slip. So be wary of stream crossings in this area for the slippage because of hydrurus. Also present in many of these sites is a um, dense coating of moss um, underwater. And uh, moss is important because it also traps particulate organic matter, and that can serve as a food and also provide protected habitat in, uh, in these shallow water streams. So um, the rock glacier source areas can vary in how much algae and moss are present, but um, in all the circumstances that I've seen anyway, um, these diminish or disappear downstream. So that hydrurus and the, and the moss seems to be mostly restricted to the, uh, the upper areas of these um, rock glaciers. And so that's the one thing that really started to pique my interest was how localized are these communities of organisms that are associated with this um, hydrurus and moss dominated shallow water environment. So besides these uh, biological elements forming the habitat, what does the temperature profile look like? Um, here's data from uh, some temperature uh, buttons that Connie put out um, that gives us an idea of what the temperatures were like for the year prior to when I came and did my last sampling at this particular site on the Excelsior Glacier. Um, so um, the temperatures during the summer, even in these shallow outflows where there's a lot of solar exposure, really never get much above five degrees centigrade. So very cold. Um, and, and that high temperature of around five degrees centigrade really only occurs for about a month or so. Um, at the beginning of this um, uh, thermograph, you can see that the temperatures in late September and early October were only about up to two degrees centigrade. And then as winter started to set in um, and the temperatures really dropped, before ice formed on the water surface and a snowpack developed insulating the stream, there were freezing temperatures probably into the bed of the stream. So that probably represents a period of real risk. So whenever the ice forms and uh, forms permanently and a snow cover forms on top of that to essentially give you this sort of December to May um, period of stability at zero degrees centigrade, there's this short to perhaps prolonged period of risk of freezing into the bed. Um, so one obvious question that pops out of this is that, uh, is this just a phenomenon of the life of the, of the rock glacier? Um, do they have distinct thermal profiles or what do things look like downstream? So we're testing this now by um, more uh, thermal monitoring sensors that um, Connie has put out at each of those four sites that you saw in that last graph from the, uh, uh, that, that, that last map from um, the places I sampled this last year. Um, just to give you a kind of context for that temperature range, here's Echo Creek, the Cathedral Fork of Echo Creek in um, Yosemite at about the same elevation. And, and this shows you a, temp temp uh, a long-term temperature profile there that shows you that it, it, it has these periods of winter freezing at right around zero degrees C, but the temperatures pop way above um, five degrees up to around 15 degrees during the summer. So it gets much warmer. Um, in these streams that don't have a glacial influence. Even more nearby is, uh, is Crown Creek up above where uh, Robinson Creek 
uh, comes out. Um, and Crown Creek um, has a lower temperature during the summer, but you can see that the winter temperatures are kind of unstable um, and it does get warmer during uh, the, the summer months, up to eight degrees centigrade. Interestingly, this is another one of the streams that does have rock glacier flow moving into it. So these colder temperatures may be um, uh, something that is related to the, uh, the prevalence of rock glacier melt as a part of the profile of the flow that goes into Crown Creek. Um, and both of those sites are part of a, a sentinel network of streams that we've studied long term. So just to give you the, the sense that rock glaciers probably do have a much more distinct thermal profile than uh, even nearby alpine streams. They also ha can have a really distinctive chemistry. So here's an analysis of some cation chemistry from uh, these, some of these different sources compared to Sierra glacial melt from another published paper. So what you see here in purple is the Barney Rock Glacier that again was the one of two sites that um, Connie and I sampled in 2019. Uh, and then again, that rock glacier from Excelsior was resampled in 2020. So those are both shown in red. And then just downstream, what I was calling the mid Excelsior rock glacier. And then in green, um, that, uh, that um, summit lake seep channel area, as well as the East Fork of Green Creek, just above um, uh, Upper Hoover Lake. And you can see that what's shown in the profile here is that those lower sites Again, lower sites that don't have that same kind of covering of hydrurus and moss that we saw up above also have a different kind of water chemistry. They have a higher cation con concentration uh, than uh, the rock glaciers. And compared to glacial melt, um, they, are, they are all much higher. So glacial melt, um, as um, I discussed before, typically has a very low conductivity and we see that here. All these streams though have a relatively low silicate content. And, uh, and silicate can be a pretty important nutrient in streams, but in the cases of a lot of these alpine streams, that silicate concentration is pretty low. It's not until you see a lot of groundwater input or lower elevations or northern Sierra type streams where there is more um, groundwater and volcanic rock influence that you see higher concentrations of silicate. It's an important nutrient to, um, to algae in the form of diatoms that grow on rock surfaces and streams. That's a really important food source to aquatic invertebrates. But um, in any event, we see a different chemical signature here for these pure rock glacier water sources in contrast to both what's downstream as well as what you'd see in glacial outflows. So what lives there? My favorite creatures, midges. <laughs> Midge larvae are normally pretty small. Um, and uh, Many of the species found in this cold water system though of the rock glacier are quite large. 10 millimeters doesn't sound like much, but it's big by midge standards. Um, they uh, are, have a very slow development, no doubt, in this cold water, but that slow development favors large size. We see this in a lot of aquatic insects um, that, uh, that live in variable temperature environments, these, these cold temperatures. Um, slow down development, but they seem to also produce uh, not only a longer lifespan, but uh, a larger size at maturity. Um, and what's more, that large body size may provide an improved reproductive success in this pretty harsh environment so that the adults that are emerging at a larger body size are not feeding, so they must rely on the, the, the nutrient sources that they store during the larval life history in, in order to um, uh, lay eggs. Uh, fast development in warm water favors small body size and short generation time. And we sat, see that in a lot of streams that are influenced by uh, warming related to intermittency and uh, that aspect of drought. On the right here are the mouth parts of Diamisa, which is known as the glacier midge. It's the second one from the top here of these four midges that are shown. And these are just to give you an idea of what the mouth parts look like in this creature. It, it grazes on algae. It looks like it might be a predator, but it's not. Uh, it's mandibles and that um, structure that uh, seems to have a series of a, a, an, another row of teeth in the center called the mentum is what they use to, to spin out silk, but also to, to scrape algae from rock surfaces. So some of the adaptations that must be associated with these high elevation environments, cold environments, are not only a metabolism that's adapted for development at these low temperatures, which means 
high Q10 or a really rapidly rising rate of metabolism as temperature increases, but also a really high proportion of these midges, not only the ones that are shown in this slide, but the one before, the one on the top in particular, um, have a lot of pigmentation in, and this pigmentation is probably protective from uh, UVB ultraviolet light damage that uh, is certainly a problem with any kind of life that uh, exists in these high mountain environments, especially in these kinds of um, streams where there's shallow water and a lot of solar exposure. They may be further be protected by living in amongst that hydrurus algae, but also this pigmentation seems to be an important part of what you see um, associated with um, the different um, species that I found. Um, I've seen a lot of midges, and this is the highest proportion of midges um, that have this kind of pigmentation in any stream I've ever seen. Um, I only have preliminary identifications of these midges so far, and many of these may be endemics. I infer that from the fact that they don't look like things that I've seen from most other streams, but they're also abundant. These things can be about 15 to 20,000 per square meter, um, and that's a lot of midges. That's a couple thousand midges per square foot. Um, the abundance of these midges may be not only related to the favorable habitat of the food that's available there, but it also may be related to the fact that a lot of the larger predatory insects that they might typically be associated with are precluded from, their, from being able to survive in these harsh environments. And so there may be an escape from predation in these, uh, in these habitats as well. So here's a breakdown of the different groups of midges and other aquatic invertebrates that I found in the Excelsior Glacier and in the Barney Glacier. So remember, the Excelsior Glacier is this glacial ice core type, whereas the Barney Glacier is this permafrost rock glacier type. Um, so you can see in both types, it's dominated by this taxon that I'm calling Orthocladius number one, something I've never seen before. It's this midge here on the right, this big one on the right that has the purplish pigmentation associated with it. Um, also important in each of these sites um, are uh, midges that you typically find in um, polar regions like Paraoclus and Hydrobenus. Diamisa is the glacier midge. So in many glacier outflow streams, this is essentially the only midge that you find. So when studying these kinds of midge communities um, and some of the early work done on these midge communities in rock glacier streams has been done in Italy, there was the expectation that they might be just the same as these um, glacial streams and that they would be dominated almost exclusively by Diamisa. Well, that was found not to be the case in the rock glaciers in Italy. And I also found that not to be the case here. There's 24 different species of midges uh, present in um, uh, between these two rock glacier types. And, uh, and there are probably more, and I have not yet identified the collections from the more extensive area of the rock glaciers um, that I sampled this last year. Um, down here below this, initial group of listing of taxa, which are the midges, um, are some dipterans that are really very not very abundant at all. This one thing here, dichronota, is a predator. And then down here, this group are the mayflies, stoneflies, and caddisflies. And below them, flatworms, which also are predators, um, a worm, and a water mite. What's really significant here is that these EPTs, or mayfly, stonefly, caddisflies, are usually dominant and they barely register in this community. But what we did find um, from a preliminary examination of the samples collected this last year is that they were abundant and prevalent in the two sites downstream. So if we make a comparison from these upper rock glacier streams here um, with the blue ellipse around them that are influenced solely by the rock glacier outflow versus these downstream that are influenced both by Summit Lake perhaps a relict rock glacier down here and, um, and, and, and spring flow as well. And then the East Fork of, uh, of Green Creek down here, just above Hoover Lake. These had a lot of uh, mayfly, stoneflies and caddisflies in them. So um, the algae and the moss, they dominate those upper reaches. They have pretty much just a diverse midge assemblage associated with them. Whereas just a really short distance downstream, the algae and moss are scarce, but you get these more diverse community of, uh, of EPT found. 
And so here's the here's a, uh, the EPT parade, the typical organisms that you see in most of these alpine and mountain streams. Uh, upper left corner is a betus mayfly and a heptagenead mayfly. Upper right is a, a pearlid predator stonefly here and a, uh, a peltopearlid uh, stonefly that's primarily a shredder of organic matter. And then um, below here are two caddisflies in their cases. So these are the kinds of organisms and community that could be sustained downstream by the flows that uh, are coming from that rock glacier. So my conclusion is that these rock glaciers are supporting both this specialized cold water community of midges and, um, uh, and a downstream community that's much more diverse community that has these typical uh, mayfly, stonefly, caddisfly dominated um, ecosystem types. Um, that flow of, of water from the rock glacier being cold and having a particular habitat type may support this specialized community um, and sustain it, but it's also sustaining downstream waters. Um, one of the questions that remains is that even deep in these crevices of the rocky streams, there may persist more habitat refuge as well, but it's, it may be essentially unsampleable. Um, if you've ever stood above the trickling water that sounds deep below in these rocky places, um, it's hard to imagine how you might actually get at that water. Um, so perhaps a new uh, frontier for science to be able to um, study what's down that deep. So with that, um, I will take some questions or comments about the work that comes from those rock glaciers. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Dave. And uh, I just want to remind everybody out there that if you have some questions, you can type them into the Q&A uh, area there, or you can raise your hand and we can, we can call to you too. Um, but, uh, you know, please feel free to ask Dave some of your questions. And I think, you know, I'll, I'll just start out with one question that I know is kind of on everyone's mind these days with the impending numbers we're seeing of this drought um, that we're, our snowpack is pretty small. And, um, you know, what sort of impacts do you predict seeing in these streams? And then, you know, how much of a, of a um, contributor are these rock glaciers to sustaining flows in these, in these streams? Yeah, that's a really good question. And it's really an impending threat. Um, as it was in 2015, the last year of that drought. Um, this year, even though it's really only this, into the second year of a drought, conditions seem to be about as severe in terms of soil mo moisture and um, how much depletion of the snowpack already exists. So um, uh, we're likely to see developing in a lot of streams that are typically perennial channels, um, a conversion to an intermittent fragmented flow. And that is really the tipping point for how communities change in a lot of these systems. Um, the perennial community has a lot of riffle habitat as well as a lot of pool habitat. So a diverse mix of organisms that are adapted to life in those kinds of environments. But once you get to fragmented flows, um, you start to get stagnation, the disappearance of riffle environments, um, the accumulation of organic matter, the lack of flushing, and so that results in outright mortality for a lot of the organisms that would otherwise be able to survive in a continuously flowing stream. Um, it might not be something that develops until later into the summer. So the, the, the spring runoff can be a sustaining period. And those organisms that can get off a generation within that time um, are probably going to end up being the winners. But those are organisms that will have short generation times like the midges. Um, but the long-lived organisms like the mayflies, stoneflies, and caddisflies, or at least many of them, will not be able to survive the bottleneck of low flows that happen during base flow, and in particular, as it goes into fall, when a lot of this intermittent pattern of, uh, of fragmented flow um, develops. So um, I'm, I'm working with another group of uh, researchers from UC Berkeley that are going to be returning to the Kings River Experimental Watershed, where Scott Cooper and I did so much of our work. And um, they're going to be revisiting a lot of those sites and asking that very question. 
um, what kind of bottleneck is there during those fall base flow conditions and how does it change the habitat um, both in terms of the physical environment and thermal environment but also how is it changing the aquatic invertebrate community um, and even though a lot of this work is centered around the aquatic invertebrate community I have to keep emphasizing that you know, they're, they're performing a really important food web function there. So they're likely to be repercussions to higher trophic levels and the more visible charismatic megafauna of, of birds, frogs, and bats and amphibians and so on. All right, thanks, Dave. Uh, we got some questions rolling in. And uh, if you would like to just start taking a stab at those, it looks like the first one, can you see those, Dave? Um, if you click on the yeah, the ones that are in the chat or the Q and A. Q and A. Um, Scott Cooper. Um, I'll just go with the first one. Speaking of Scott. Okay. Hi, Scott. Um, thanks, Dave. Great talk. Can you say something about the adult stage of the cold water midges, given the very short flight season? Do they emerge synchronously, or do they oviposit in specific habitats within the stream? How long do they live before dying? I do not know. <laughs> <laughs> that's a really good question though scott that's a that's such an important part of the life cycle of aquatic insects that often goes ignored by those of us that are just sampling in the water um, i do know that there's been some recent research done by lenny farrington who's uh one of the the uh the gods of of uh, the chironomidae the midges um, that looks at the the cold tolerance of adult diamesa and as you might expect, they can survive sub-freezing temperatures um, th throughout their life cycle and reproduce. So uh, diamesa is one of those things that in the adult stage um, has uh, apparently has adaptations for sub-freezing conditions uh, to be able to survive. I suspect these other midges that are in these same rock glacier streams have similar kinds of adaptations. All right, and on that note, the next question, um, is about what migration changes of winged insects, such as Lepidoptera um, and others, have you noted? Well, um, that, that, that moves into the terrestrial realm there. So I'm not so sure about what the consequences would be to um, Lepidoptera. They're not aquatic. <clears throat> but I do know that there has been a lot of research done on Lepidoptera in the Sierra Nevada and changes in distribution by Art Shapiro at UC Davis. And he and his students have documented um, really pronounced changes in the, both the elevational distribution and abundance of Lepidoptera throughout the Sierra. And as you might imagine, both uh, um, uh, uh, rising distributions with elevation and depletion of many populations. Um, but I would refer that, um, that uh, you to, to the research by Art Shapiro out of UC Davis. He's retired now, but um, if, if, you, if you Google Art Shapiro's name, you'll find some of his publications. That's cool. And for those of you out there who don't know what Lepidoptera are, um, butterflies in the lake, right? Um, so the next question is about algae. Um, there was a lot of algae in streams after the 2015 drought, and it did not go away after the 2017 big snow year. And is that harmful? Um, and, and, you know, benthic algae in streams can certainly be what, what, you, what you can think of as something that fouls the habitat. It really prevents a lot of the oversurface movement that um, a lot of aquatic insects require to be able to move around and feed and um, uh, seek, seek prey in the, in the case of predators. Um, we also saw that there was a lot of accumulation of algae uh, during the drought. And that probably is related to um, how little flushing flow was available to move that um, algae out of the systems. Um, that can result in a lot of stagnation, low dissolved oxygen concentration. So definitely a stressor. Um, uh, as to where it, wh whether or why it did not go away in 2017, I'm not so sure about that. Uh, the, the streams that we continued to do work on 
definitely did have algae flushed out of them after that year. Um, the, the high flows of that year in particular in a lot of mountain streams um, scoured a lot of habitats and so uh, flushed a lot of that algae downstream. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's usually the high flow conditions that will, that will um, result in, in less algae present and the low flow conditions that let it accumulate. But some of that can be related also to whether or not uh, fish are present in streams. So another study that I did with Scott um, some years ago was a comparison of uh, streams in Yosemite with and without fish. Streams that had fish in them um, had a lot more algae in them as well. Uh, and that was uh, apparently because of um, a uh, release of um, algae uh, or, or a, a consumption of, of, of large algae grazer invertebrates that allowed that, that algae to grow up. So with fish present, um, algae grazers were depleted and so um, algae continued to be present. And that is true regardless of the flow level. So maybe you were, see you were looking in streams where there were fish present too, which can be another condition that leads to higher uh, density of algae in the streams. Nice. Yeah, so a little bit of a trophic cascade effect right. there. Um, the next question is from Connie. Um, maybe we should add some talus derived streams to survey as they also produce cold waters, if not as cold persistent as rock glacier springs, comparison to snowpack origin streams. So, um, yeah, maybe you could comment on uh, some of those talus derived streams. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And I think, you know, Connie's the real expert in this. She has surveyed so many rock glaciers and identified a lot of different subtypes there. So whether these are these talus slopes or moraine slopes or valley wall avalanches, there's all kinds of different ways that, um, that uh, the permafrost can form in these different rock formations as well as um, different mechanisms by which pre-existing glaciers have been buried by, by debris. Mm -hmm. um, and so the extent to which there's weathering that goes on in those different types, I think will change the water chemistry. And that's one of the things that may change the type of organisms that are there. Um, Connie may also be alluding to the fact that um, there's, there's a developing group of international rock glacier fanatics, uh, amongst them our friends in Italy, that um, want to do these very kinds of studies to look at what sorts of differences there are in the, um, the, the springs and flows that emanate from these different um, uh, rock types and lithologies and how that water chemistry and thermal profile may alter the kinds of biological communities that are associated. So that, I think that'll really be an interesting and developing area. Um, you know, besides that, one of the things I'm really interested in, and this doesn't really answer the question that much more, but because these midge communities seem to be so distinctive, one of the things I plan on doing um, with both the samples I have and future ones is to do some DNA barcoding so that we can get at what sorts of specific distinctions there may be amongst these populations relative to what are, what's known and what kind of um, uh, differences exist between these um, different rock type, uh, rock glacier type outflows. Yeah, nice. Um, Sally asks, are all Sierran rock glaciers in protected areas such as wilderness? And if not, what can be done to better protect and help sustain them? Yeah, that's a really good question, Sally. Thank you for that, because that really goes to the conservation issue here. Um, I'm not really sure what we can do to protect rock glaciers other than that we, what we do to protect other habitats that we know a harbor um, uh, species and communities that have um, a lot of diverse, that harbor a lot of diversity or unusual organisms. Um, we do know that these rock glaciers, um, of which there are, are hundreds of them from the surveys that Connie has done, are mostly on these north facing slopes. So I think we can identify some of the areas where they're likely to have most influence in being able to sustain the downstream communities that otherwise are subject to snow drought and other um, um, uh, 
circumstances of drying that, that create these intermittent uh, conditions that, that produce this threshold of impact to aquatic communities. Um, so I think we can identify um, uh, these places in these northern drainages and associated with rock glaciers and do what we can to, um, to, to call those out as special places that we need to eliminate as much as possible other stressors from so that we can sustain those communities. Nice, good, good conservation question there. Um, so Scott asks about um, stability. Do the rock glacier streams flood or are they more stable? They seem to be pretty stable. Um, those, cha those channels that are, that are high up in those watersheds, they'll get, they'll get snow melt, but that'll be slow snow melt that percolates um, into the stream channel along with the outflow from the rock glacier. There's no evidence that I could see on the channel margins that there was, that there was much scouring or, um, uh, or erosion of the upper parts of those channels. Now the lower parts of those channels for sure, down near the Hoover Lake site, there was certainly evidence that there was um, erosion and, and, uh, and bank sloughing that had gone on down in that area. So I think a lot of the consequences of flood damage are really gonna be realized much further downstream than um, where the rock glaciers are. There's just not enough uh, in-stream energy to produce a lot of change. Plus they are so extensively armored by this plate-like granite that's in them that uh, I think they, that, that that really forms a protected habitat as well um, for those organisms. And what's more, many of those organisms could be hyperaic. They could, they could disappear down into the crevices of that rock and thereby um, be protected from the influence of, of, uh, of flood flows. All right, we got a question here um, about the fires and uh, have the many fires that we've had in the last years resulted in more ash in the streams? And if so, is that, is that bad? You know, I'd really like to defer to Scott Cooper here <laughs> because um, that's something that he's done a lot of work with and I'm only beginning to understand. Scott, are you there? Can you uh, say something about that? Maybe Scott can uh, get on the chat here. Let's see. Let's see. Well, in the meantime, maybe we'll just follow, follow up with the one last question I have here, um, which kind of gets at um, the issue we were talking about earlier with, with, with climate change and the year that we're facing right now is what percentage of flow in the stream speeding Mono Lake from the East Slope will likely come from rock glaciers in a drought year like we're facing this year? Um, I, I don't know the answer to that either. That's again, something I would, I would have to defer to Connie about. I know that we know something about the relative proportions of ice that are in those glaciers compared, the rock glaciers compared to, to surface glaciers. I don't know that there's been a sort of watershed by watershed analysis of what what volume of water is available from those um, yeah. glaciers that would sustain water levels in Mono Lake, for example. My suspicion is that they would not, that, they were, that we're mostly talking about flows that sustain the headwater environments of alpine streams rather than the surface water levels of something like Mono Lake that requires a lot more inflow. I don't know, Connie, what do you think? Connie's out there, or Scott is out there. Uh, let's see. I can. We're braving the limits of our technology here, Dave. <laughs> Connie, Connie says, "I don't think we need, we can answer that question yet." But wouldn't yeah. we love to know? Yeah, it, it's true. I, I mean, there's an awful lot we don't. There, there's there's an awful lot more we don't know about rock glaciers yet than we do. And I feel like I'm really at the early stages of my understanding of rock glaciers, and it's pretty limited to what their effect is on these high elevation alpine headwater environments. And as far as their linkages to sustaining flows much further downstream, we, we would need to make some more measurements and get some better means of assessing what that might be. There, there might be chemical signals that we can use 
And so uh, that, that might be worth investigating. Yeah. Here's hey, Connie. Carol. Uh, oh, sorry. Can I have a little input? All right. We've got Connie and Scott on. Who first? Oh, go ahead, Connie. Well, I was just thinking that uh, one of the things that we do know is that these Grot Glacier Springs, they produce pretty local waters. So for sure, they're important to the upland areas adjacent to the snouts and in, in the areas of their springs. And that's very important because, of course, that's where a lot of biodiversity is harbored. But we really don't know, other than some very important studies by Dave Clough, for instance, at in the Rockies about their contribution to way downstream waters such as Mono Lake. So that's why I say it's such an important question. My guess is it's pretty small, but that doesn't diminish the importance to the biota in the uplands. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a lot of unknown biodiversity up in those headwater environments. And, and that's really, I think, where the significance of the flows from the rock glaciers lies is, is how they um, sustain those um, headwater alpine stream environments. Scott, what do you think about ash? Uh, so could you repeat the uh, fire question, Carol? Oh, sorry, you're muted. Um, have the many fires resulted in more ash in the streams? And if so, is that bad? Uh, yeah, certainly ash is, um, has a negative influence on stream water chemistry and the invertebrates and fish that live there. It, it often changes pH, it's often high in heavy metals. Um, in some cases in New Mexico where they've studied it, if you get enough ash deposition, you will have microbes attack the ash, and deplete oxygen, so you get oxygen depletion and then fish kills. So, but it all depends upon how much ash. And uh, if the stream is in an area that's surrounded by burning or if it's downstream of that, how the ash gets transported, but there are definitely a lot of knock-on effects on water chemistry and the, the things that live in the stream. There have been a little bit of study uh, in lakes where they've looked at ash deposition and there they've wondered about how uh, ash deposition has changed light climates in the lakes by intercepting light. And that might affect where the algae are producing and, and where uh, the things that eat the algae occur. But certainly ash is a consideration, it just depends upon the intensity of the burn, how much ash gets either washed in or deposited from the air. And, and then if you get enough ash, you certainly do have a lot of knock-on effects. All right, awesome. Thank you, everyone. And uh, uh, I want to be conscious of time and uh, just free everyone to go. But I, I greatly appreciate, Dave, your, um, your talk, your knowledge, your expertise. It was fascinating. And uh, Scott, Connie, you guys for jumping on and weighing in. It's like such a panel of experts right here. It's amazing having this, uh, this forum on this topic. And it's just something that's so new and interesting for us to really be thinking about. So thank you so much. Um, thanks everyone and hope you can join us next week where we'll be uh, talking with Tom Stevenson about um, large mammals and wildlife biology and the uncomfortable reality of the effects of predators on endangered species recovery. So thanks again, Dave, awesome. Here's to a field trip to rock glaciers. Okay, great. Good night, everyone. Good night.